a very good afternoon and thank you everyone for joining in to begin with today's discussion i would like to quote these beautiful lines which i recently read look up at the star and not down at your feet try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist be curious quotations by stephen hawking universe is vast and yet magnificent there are so many questions theories related to the universe that are unanswered and at the same time we all are super curious to get the answer of all such enigmatic secret of it today as a part of world space week 2021 during our session on enigmatic universe we will try to unfold all such mysteries of universe to share presentation on the topic we have with us mr snake mr kesri is a science communicator by birth and an astronomer by hobby with close to 25 years of pursuing astronomy and stargazing as hobby snake is well versed with the concepts of astronomy and space sciences he has about 11 years of professional experience of teaching astronomy to kids and has created to nearly 400 schools and over 50000 students in the last decade knowledge of the night sky and astrophotography are his strongest point rather than teaching for last two years snay is successfully running his own firm which provides all round solution for astronomy enthusiasts be it learning about the sky science or buying equipment he loves to see the hidden gems of cosmos through the telescope and also to capture the aura of night sky through his lens and also happy to share his passion with the young students and curious adult today he will be helping us in understanding the enigmatic universe planetarium welcome you sir all budding mind are interested to know more detail about the universe over to you uh thank you very much for having me today and uh, a very happy world space week to all of you uh we are uh, uh, extremely excited for, for this global celebration and uh, i'm really feel honored uh, to be called by the planet team to interact with all of you so uh today we're going to talk about universe uh universe is more like a mystery there are things which we don't know there are things we expect uh, but we haven't found all in all uh, we have observed about 5% of the universe so far uh, maybe less but uh, every day we are learning something new about it there are a lot of mysteries and today uh, we are going to just talk about you know some very strange facts about the universe in this presentation so uh, can we have the screen share uh, uh, yes all right uh thank you uh, very much i'll just uh, start with it so uh, as i was saying the universe is a very strange place there are a lot of good things that are happening we don't really know and that is why the cosmos or the universe is very enigmatic you know uh it's it's like something very strange for example this fact number 1 space is completely silent all right so Uh, when you are in outer space or if you ever go to outer space you cannot communicate with anybody uh, you know verbally verbally as in without the help of any uh, device uh, sound waves that are generated when we are speaking they require some sort of medium to travel through uh they tra- they can travel through air they can travel through uh metal they can travel through wood uh they can travel through water as well but they need some sort of medium and as we know space is complete vacuum there is uh, no material around and that is why we cannot uh, you know uh, even if we speak the waves will not pass on to the other person and will not fall on their ear drums uh the realm between the stars uh, will always be a uh, very silent uh worlds with atmosphere and air pressure do allow sound to travel hence why there's plenty of noise on earth and likely other planets as well but if we are let's say floating out in space like we go for space walks 
uh, the astronauts go for spacewalks, they cannot communicate among each other without the help of a radio. Uh, another thing for you guys to learn and understand is that sound waves are, uh, you know, uh, they when they are moving, they kind of oscillate. And this oscillation uh, of waves as they enter our ear, they falls on eardrum. And based on the this oscillation, uh, the waves are translated into audio that is registered in our brain and we believe we are hearing things and every different uh, sound has a different wave oscillation as a result we can hear it around but not in space because the sound waves cannot oscillate in space now uh, the moon landing one of the very uh, uh, you know controversial topics but we are not going to discuss that here, uh, but we are going to, uh, I'm going to talk about a very interesting fact that is the Apollo astronauts uh, from Apollo mission 11 all the way till 18. Uh, all the astronauts who have landed on the moon and who have walked around it, uh, they have left their footprints behind and the footprints will probably gonna stay on the surface of the moon for at least a hundred million years. Now, this is an estimation based on a lot of facts and since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere like earth has or some other planets have there is no wind or water to erode or wash away like if you remember if you have ever been to a beach and you're walking on the sand uh, as the wave comes by uh, the footprints that are left behind on the wave or uh, on the sand are kind of washed away with water also, if you leave something out in the open, like some powder or something, the wind blows and it kind of moves it away. So these are the atmospheric phenomena that we observe on Earth and other planets which have atmosphere or gases around. Now, on the moon, there is no atmosphere and definitely there is no water that is flowing on the surface. So the astronauts who have walked over this uh, on the surface of the moon uh, have left their footprints or the rover prints or any other kind of print, the man-made prints which are there. Uh, these things will always going to be there. Now, there is a long shot, you know, just, just, there is a possibility that these prints might vanish, but that will not be because of any of the atmospheric uh, condition, but exactly due to the lack of atmospheric uh, conditions on the moon. And that is the constant bombardment of space rocks, which may be the size of a, a, a grain or a size of a car uh, that keeps bombarding the surface. As they fall on the surface of the moon, it kind of have an impact on the surface and material ejects and they fall back at a distance. So that might be one thing that can really alter the scenery on the surface of the moon. And probably these footprints might vanish. But other than that, they can go for millions of years there. Another interesting thing about our solar system is that our sun is practically uh, the only heavy object in the solar system. It contains approximately 99% of the entire solar system mass. That means if you have a weighing scale on one side, if you put sun and on the other side, you have all the eight planets, all their moons, asteroids, comets, dwarf planets, you know, all the tiny little uh, meteors, which are there, everything when you include still sun is going to be 99% of all the, uh, you know, all the mass on the other side. Now this is very very important because at the time of formation of the solar system all the mass all the hydrogen gas that was there that kind of concentrated near the center and now it is inside the sun okay uh, our sun is a g type main sequence star which means that every second it fuses approximately 600 million tons of hydrogen to helium and helium is heavier than hydrogen atoms. So, you know, it weight kinds of keep on increasing. It also converts about 4 million tons of matter to energy as a byproduct that we are receiving. But most importantly, 
the entire solar system is bound together due to the gravitational pull of the sun and this gravitational pull is coming from the enormous mass that it has contained since the formation of the solar system now there is more energy from the sun that uh, you know that is hit on earth every hour than the planet uses in entire year so as we are you know uh, advancing in uh, technology as uh, our dependence on the electricity is ever growing as we require energy to run our machinery and practically our life the demand for energy is increasing all of this demand can be met by harvesting sun's energy but the problem is that the sun's energy is very difficult to harvest so much so that whatever energy we require for one entire year we kind of receive it in just one hour all right if we find a way to even harvest 1% of that energy all our energy problems will be resolved and this is going to be an absolutely you know uh absolutely safe and absolutely healthy way of harnessing energy rather than using coal uh, using coal or other means of dirty energy producing techniques unfortunately we have only about 0.7% of the energy requirement that has been harvested from the sun uh, on an average every year we really have to increase it to a little more so that our dependence on these uh, dirty uh, you know or these uh, polluting sources of uh, energy generation uh, can be wiped out and we can move towards a more cleaner and greener source of energy uh solar energy harvesting has been increasing at a rate of uh, 20% each year that means every year we are adding more solar power plants around more solar cells around to generate energy but still it is not giving us enough so sun's energy is going to be very very helpful for us one day on venus is longer than one year on the planet now generally we know that uh, there are 365.25 days on earth every year and this is a correlation that we have derived from the rotation of earth around its own axis that is uh, completing one round around itself uh, that marks the day whereas going one round around the sun and coming back to the original position marks a year but venus is slightly different from us in many ways though it is also called as a twin planet to earth venus has an extremely slow axis of rotation the axis of rotation is uh, uh, so slow that it takes about 243 earth days to complete one full cycle okay so as earth spins 243 times around its axis venus is just completing one round around itself funny enough it takes venus even less time uh, in terms of earth days to complete one revolution around the sun 226 to be precise that means before it completes one round around itself it has completed one round around the sun so like here we have to wait for 365 days uh, to cut our birthday uh, cake again on venus you can probably do it uh, twice in a day all right how fun would that be Furthermore, the sun rises every 117 Earth days on Venus. That is, after every 117 Earth days, there is a sunrise on Venus, which means that the sun rises uh, uh, only two times during each year, which is also all technically in the same day. Since Venus rotates clockwise, the sunrise will happen in the west rather than in the east, as we have, you know, on Earth. and it sets in the east unlike on earth where it sets in the west so everything is very different on venus another thing venus has a very dense atmosphere 
it rains there but it doesn't rain liquid water it rains sulfuric acid so if you happen to be on the surface of venus you probably need a metallic umbrella which can avoid or you know which does not react with sulfuric acid and uh, unlike earth where you can you know just go out and enjoy the rain uh, that fun and enjoyment on venus is going to be very dangerous probably catastrophic for any one of us now my favorite fact uranus and neptune rains diamond so like we are talking about the rain on different planets earth has water venus has sulfuric acid if you happen to stand on jupiter or uh, sorry uranus or neptune you will have the rain of diamond above you now deep within neptune and uranus it rains diamond also astronomers and physicists have suspected for nearly 40 years the outer planets of our solar system are hard to study however only one space mission voyager 2 has flown by to reveal some of their secrets and very recently the new horizon spacecraft has also gone past some of these but they haven't studied uh, these planets so much in detail now it is believed that Inside the gaseous layer of these planets, the temperature and pressure are so high that the carbon atoms which are present in the atmosphere or in the gaseous envelope are all converted into diamond, a process that we have not only observed but we have understood very well on Earth as well, uh, that is uh, during the diamond mining. Some of the diamond, some of the coal plants in uh, on Earth are so deep that the temperature and pressure increases to such high level that the coal is converted into diamond. And we believe the similar conditions to be uh, present on these uh, places, uh, you know, on these uh, planets, that uh, all the carbon atoms are converting into diamond, uh, and they are because of the high gravitational pull are being pulled towards the center of the planet that is towards the core of the planet and hence the diamond uh, rain is possible on these planets okay uh, as we move further down in space uh, one thing that we would like to really uh, talk about is the number of stars and there are a lot of things that we have heard as a kid uh, that the number of stars in the sky equivalent to the number of hair on your head uh, well, it is still possible to count the number of hair on your head, but there are uncountable stars in the known universe. We basically have no idea how many stars there are in the universe. Right now, we use our estimates to uh, estimates of how many stars are there uh, in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. We then multiply that number by the best estimates or here in case guesstimates of the number of galaxies in the universe. After all that math, NASA can only confidently say that there are zillions of uh, uncountable stars. A zillion is any uncountable number, any random number which is big enough to be, uh, you know, beyond the uh, num trillion number it can be probably a pentamillion or uh, you know 10 to the power 16 numbers anything an australian national university study put their estimates at 76 trillion put another way that's 70,000 million 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 stars now there's a very simple way of calculating the number of stars at your end also uh, in the observable universe you know if you just take out the uh, you know a pen a ballpoint pen stretch your arm and look uh, at the tip of the pen by closing uh, you know one eye and you will um, and you will see that uh, the tip of the pen is covering some area in the sky that area is probably having about 5000 galaxies from uh, you know towards the uh, depth of the universe now imagine how many galaxies would be covering the entire sky now a best guess about 100 billion stars in every galaxy on an average big or small now you multiply those numbers and you reach to possibly an unimaginable number uh, and that many stars are expected to be there 
Now, you must be thinking, if there are so many stars in the sky, why cannot we see so many stars in our sky? The problem is the light pollution. We can see up to uh, about 6,000 stars in one night. But for that, we have to be at a place where there is no source of light pollution. That is somewhere in the middle of the ocean in the night. Okay. And that is also not possible because the cruise ship you will be on, it will have lights all around. So you have to really find yourself at a place where there are barely any light source around. And if you go to even a dark sky location, this is what the sky looks like. Uh, there are a lot of stars in the sky. Uh, from the city like Delhi, Mumbai or any other metropolitan city where we live, uh, there are so much of light pollution that most of the faint stars light does not even reach us. So we can't see. We can only see the bright ones. So that is another reason why we can't see so many stars in the sky. But then there are. North star or the pole star. The fun fact number eight. The North star uh, is going to change its position or rather the position of the North star will change in the sky over time. And that means navigation which was primarily based on the study of Polaris or its position in the sky uh, will be very difficult because all our systems are based on that. So fun fact is uh, in the 1700s, the Britishers who were the masters of the sea at that time learned how to navigate uh, at night using the pole star. Pole star can easily tell you your latitude, that is uh, where on earth you are standing. It would work only in the northern hemisphere, but then that's fine. Pretty much half the hemisphere you have covered. So the height of pole star above the ground in terms of degrees from the horizon will tell you your coordinate, that is your latitude. And this was used as one of the very important tools for navigation back in the days. Today we have GPS and everything, so it is fine. But still, in the night sky, when you are looking at a specific constellation, when you are trying to point your telescope somewhere, you need to learn these directions. And these directions will come only by with the knowledge of your pole star. Now, the pole star is going to change every 13,000 years. Uh, if you observe carefully, if you look at, uh, you know, the star trail images, you will see that even the pole star is not fixed at a point and it is making a small circle. That is because the Earth's axis is changing its position uh, through a motion called precision. Imagine a lattu, all right? And when you spin, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you spin the lattu, what happens is it keeps on spinning. But as it slows down, it keeps on moving in random directions, right? This is what is happening with Earth. The Earth's axis, where the Earth is spinning, this axis is also moving in a, a circular motion. And this motion is called precision. And it will keep on changing every 13,000 years, all right? So it has a cycle of 26,000 years where it will come back to the same original star. Initially, uh, in 3000 BC, it is believed that the North Star was the star called Tuban, otherwise known as Alpha Draconis, the brightest star in the constellation Draco. In about 13,000 years, the star Vega will be our new North Star. So thank God it is a bright star, so we can see it even from some of the dirtiest light pollution skies uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. But in 26,000 years from now, Polaris will return to its original position as the Earth continues to go through this process of precision. All right. Neutron stars can spin at a rate of 600 rotations per second. Now, as we have already discussed, rotation is spinning of an object around its own axis. All right. So neutron star are one of the possible evolutionary endpoint of a high mass star. High mass star means something which is very big, very heavy, and it is burning fuel at a very high rate. For example, Sirius, brightest star in the night sky in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. Sirius is a high mass star. 
it is a very big in size and it is burning a lot of fuel uh, at the same time now neutron stars are possibly the last stage of a high mass star they are born in a core collapse supernova star explosion so these bright stars uh, when they die they die in a very beautiful explosion we call it a supernova when the explosion happen inside a star the core which is from hydrogen it has converted into helium and further to other heavy elements finally it is made up of iron and when it can't further convert into anything else that means the star has no fuel to burn it explodes and because of the explosion the core or the helium uh, sorry the iron core kind of collapses and it becomes a very dense uh, you know a very small uh, star which is all made up of neutrons that means all the electrons and protons have combined together and they form neutrons they are very heavy they are very small and hence uh, they are highly gravitational and uh, you know uh, uh, their gravitational pull is very high and subsequently because of this extremely high rate of explosion they start spinning very fast uh, neutron stars can rotate up to 60 times per second after born but as the forces start acting on it some some of them have been studied to have a rotational period of 600 times per second so imagine a big star is spinning around its axis 600 times every second now if two pieces of same type of metal touch in space they will bond and be permanently stuck together so like you are welding two pieces of iron on earth so you use a mechanism called welding which is uh, going to fix both of them uh, and you can't detach them in space you don't need anything just take the two metal and you just touch them on the side of wherever you want to connect and they will be like a, a a single piece of metal that was there there will be no sign of joints nothing and it will be permanent and it's not like when you bring them back to earth they will change no they will be fixed permanently this amazing effect is called cold welding uh it has been used uh, to attach many pieces of international space station and other space stations that were there in space earlier it happens because atoms of individual pieces of metal have no way of knowing that they are different pieces of metal so they lump and join together the the, the low temperature uh, which is practically very close to zero and absolute vacuum really makes it uh, possible for the atoms to fuse together and join together this wouldn't happen on earth because there is air and water separating the pieces so even when we don't know there is air inside every atom all right or rather air air is made up of all the hydrogen and helium and everything so these things are so there is small pockets of air when the two surfaces meet and this stops them from attaching together but in space because there is no air uh, it becomes very easy to join two pieces of uh, you know uh, same element together okay uh, the universe is at least 14 billion years old now this is uh when big bang was expected or we believe that the big bang happened 14 billion years ago and this is how we have quantified the age of the universe now how do astronomers know when something happened all right so there is a theory that big bang happened that is uh you know uh, uh, there was a huge blast in the universe and everything started appearing in the universe of form right after that blast okay now the theory dictates that the when the explosion happened there were different kind of elements or different kind of objects that were formed in the early universe all right and the universe is expanding also so that means when the light that originated from the first possible stars they are taking their time to reach earth based on the distance and 
as astronomers are scanning the night sky for all the fantastic galaxies and nebulae and the clusters around the universe, they are locating these rare objects called quasars, which was expected to be uh, made right after Big Bang or in the initial few million years. So as astronomers have studied the distance or the time taken by light to reach us, we believe that this is when the Big Bang happened. Now, with looming discrepancies about the true age of the universe, we believe that about 40, 50 million years here and there is possible, but the exact age of the universe, they have zeroed it down to 13.77 or 13.78 billion, which is nearly about 14 billion years. So this is how old our universe is. But remember, there's only 5% of universe that we have seen. And we are now learning to scan the entire universe using other electromagnetic radiations. For example, infrared, ultraviolet, gamma rays, radio waves, and so on. So it is going to take time to see more universe, which is so far hidden from our eyes. So of course, this number will keep on changing, but it will take some time before the facts will come into us. So right now, we can safely say that the universe is only about 14 billion years old. Okay, uh, as we are talking about the large distances, there is one thing that we are absolutely proud of uh, as a humanity that we are now ready to travel uh, interstellar. And by interstellar, I don't mean diff between two galaxies. But I mean that we are now ready to travel between the empty spaces between two stars. Uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 that were launched in December 1977 and January 1978, uh, you know, uh, just within a gap of few weeks. They have been flying out in space ever since then. So it has been a good 44, 45 years for which it has traveled and it has gone past Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and now it is beyond Oort Cloud. In fact, Voyager 1 crossed the interstellar space in August of 2012, practically nine years ago, and is now still continuously collecting valuable data and transmitting it back to Earth. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 have been flying longer than any other spacecraft in the history. In fact, no other spacecraft, whether it could be close to Earth or very far away from us, has survived this long with all the communications working fine, the computers working fine, and so on. All right. Uh, now they are going into the uncharted ter territory. Back in 2020, we received a very interesting uh, radio signal from one of the spaceship which were, has recorded a very nice hum in space just at the edge of interstellar space now this is the first time anything from interstellar space anything has gone there all right so it is a very 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 critical moment for humanity because now we are going to learn uh, something which we had no other way to do and also we are going to be at a place where nobody has been. So with our understanding of how interstellar space works, we can probably look at a, you know some long range flight going to a nearby uh, you know exoplanetary system, which is around Proxima Centauri B at about 4.25 light years distance away. So there are a lot of things to learn from in the coming decades or so, and we hope that this thing will work out. By the way, there are five spacecraft which are on the verge of uh, uh, leaving the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the solar system. Voyager 1 and 2 are there. New Horizon is there. And there are a couple of more which I can't really think the name from top of my head right now. And the very fascinating fact, another very, uh, uh, you know, interesting object that the humans have created and we should pat our back for you know, the technology advancement we have achieved. NASA's Parker Solar Probe is the fastest man-made object in the universe so far. 
Nothing built by human hands has ever traveled faster than NASA's Parker Solar Probe. The probe, which launched in August of 2018 on a mission to study the sun, has been flying ever closer to our solar system furnace. Using the planet Venus as a slingshot, that is, whenever it is going closer to the sun, it goes around planet Venus and seek help from its gravitational pull, and it kind of uses as a slingshot and it goes around the sun. On April 29, during its closest approach to the sun, that was this year, uh, when it was reaching very closer to the sun, the gravitational assist from Venus and the gravitational pull from the sun really, you know, made Parker travel at such high speeds, that is 330,000 miles per hour or 532 kilometers per hour. And its closest approach to sun was about 10.4 million kilometers. So it's like standing inside a furnace of uh, which is located inside three more furnaces. It would be that hot uh, for the probe. And it has withstand not just the temperature, but the high speeds. The speed is so high that our Parker Solar Probe can orbit Earth about 13 times in one hour. Imagine International Space Station takes about 91 minutes to complete one rotation around the Earth, one revolution around the Earth, and the fastest jet plane takes about 26 hours for a round trip around the Earth, all right? Or a commercial jet available takes about 15 hours or 14 hours to reach from Delhi to San Francisco, and covering the other part will make it another 25, 26 hours, so about 30 hours is what it will take. So this is what, uh, you know, some of the facts about the universe are. Please understand the universe is full of mysteries and a lot of them still needs to be understood with whatever limited technology and understanding of the space we have. Budding astronomers and scientists are the future of this process and we are kind of working on the foundation laid by uh, the previous generation of scientists and astronomers, for example, Hubble made in the late 80s, launched in early 90s, and now it is helping today's astronomers prove their theories and hypotheses. Uh, we're waiting for something exciting to happen as the time goes by. So thank you very much for listening to it. Thank you so much, Sneen, for sharing such wonderful uh, facts with all of us and also given us some insight like universe is uh, so much magnificent and yet enigmatic and some uh, really interesting fact we unfold today uh, during the discussion. Now I'll request all the participants uh, because during the session also they have some doubts and they were continuously posting in the chat. So uh, we'll be taking those uh, doubts uh, now. Even we request everyone yeah. if they have some questions related to the discussion. Kindly post your questions, doubt in the chat box so that we can highlight those. Uh, I'm really surprised. Like uh, one of the question during uh, any of the space talk we do is the black holes. Yes, always is there. Always. So we'll take the very recent updated questions. Sir, how were one and two have enough fuel to travel such great distance? So, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And I'm really sorry I forgot to uh, you know address it on the slide. You know what? Because space has no friction, uh, because there is no air, there is no surface, uh, there is no friction. You practically are just flowing in space. Like when you ride your bicycle and you stop pedaling it, you will feel that uh, the cycle is getting slower. That is because of the friction between the rubber tires and the surface of your, uh, you know, the road. But in space, there is nothing like that. So you actually don't have to put any more energy. At whatever speed you, let's say, turn off your engine, it will continue with that speed. And astronomers are very smart. They are very, uh, you know, uh, very smart in a way that as they pass around, you know, the solar system, they plan the trajectory in such a way that you go very close to one of the planets 
and the gravity of that planet increases your speed so you are basically getting free acceleration something like uh, sliding you know uh, cycling downwards on a slope so you don't paddle but you still feel that your bicycle is going faster something like that without putting energy you are getting good returns so they don't have any fuel but they uh, use this technology to work around it so only All right, next the planet question. in the whole universe which has life um so there are two things first we don't know about the whole universe because we haven't really reached out or we haven't really scanned the entire universe there is only 5 to 6% of the universe that we have scanned so far and in that we are the only planet which has life confirmed on it there are researches going on using kepler mission kepler 1 kepler 2 and the test spacecraft they have been looking at the stars with possible planetary systems around and you'll be surprised to note that we have gathered about 6 to 7000 such planets orbiting around a different stars out of which there are more than 1500 planets that have a very promising uh, you know uh, signs that can support life on the uh, on these planets so the studies are going on probably in another uh, century or so we will find life on another planet hopefully i am very you know thinking positive about it yeah definitely no okay no earth is not the only there are alien in some part of the big universe okay this is not the question actually for the comment <laughs> <laughs> how do the how spaceship do spaceships travel, travel? temperature uh, near to zero zero so uh, all the spaceships have a protective layering so the metal cannot really function at uh, you know a very low temperatures so the spaceships are designed in a way that there are a protective layering on the outside that protects the metal Uh, from exposing to such low temperatures or absolute vacuum if you remember in 2003 uh, space shuttle columbia where when kalpana chavla had died had a similar problem where some of the heat shield uh, uh, had fallen off so there are similar uh, arrangements on these uh, spacecrafts which uh, are exposed in the vacuum so that is how they uh, remain in space for longer duration near absolute zero temperatures and they still work out fine karan shrivastava sneha sir please answer why universe is full of mysteries i think sneha sir has very clearly explained the various facts related to your question but still uh, we'll take your comments sneha on this um mystery is just a word given to things that we know are there but we don't know why they are there all right that is the mystery we don't know why it is happening and it is primarily because only about 400 years ago we started looking up in the sky using a tool called telescope only about you know 60 years ago on 4th october 1957 we sent the first rocket and the first spacecraft uh, into space and uh, only in the 1961 so you know like about 50 52 years back uh, 50 years back in fact uh, we sent the first one into space so our learning about the universe is very limited because our exposure to universe has been very less and that is the reason why there are a lot of things which are still a mystery and like i said the budding uh, astronomers and the young generation who is working towards is uh, uh, something we are looking forward to as the technology will be advanced our learning would be better so yeah so these mysteries will resolve itself very soon yes and one very continuous question i am getting in the chat box is related to the alien news which usa has released some of the students are quoting that 
so uh, we really want to clarify those uh, do alien exist do we... so there are two things that we need to first understand alien is one term extraterrestrial is another term aliens is a, a term given to somebody who doesn't belong to the place for example if you go on a vacation to the us you are an alien to them all right but you are not an extraterrestrial so wherever we travel or whenever we visit some place which does which we doesn't belong to like the mountains beaches another country anything so we are an alien there but the extraterrestrials are something which i have which, you know uh, which may be coming from another planet like in the movies we have seen the uh, a lot of sightings that are there in the uh, uh, you know uh, in the sky are of ufos now ufo always doesn't mean an alien ship ufo means unidentified flying object if there is something flying over your head and you can't identify what it is you simply call it a ufo and there are a lot of government uh, exercises goes on which are testing new skills or new equipment or they are just trying to develop a new aircraft so there are a lot of things that happen around us which we are not aware of it but at the same time not everything can be pointed towards some extraterrestrial life walking among us if that happens it will be a uh, very uh, freaky and uh, it will be very scary yeah so why do you think that expansion of the universe is accelerating a uh, good question uh, now i'm going to be a little technical about it the expansion of the universe is accelerating uh, it has been observed because the objects like quasars or very old objects or old galaxies that we have studied uh they are showing a smaller value of redshift as compared to the objects which are relatively new year or which are relatively closer to earth okay so now imagine this is the universe around us we are at the center here okay and we see on one corner we have quasars which are coming towards us at let's say 0.1 or 0.2 redshift whereas the objects which are coming closer to us are going at a redshift of 0.7 or 0.8 r now this really shows that the universe is expanding and not just expanding but accelerating as well for those who don't know what is a redshift it is uh, redshift is a term or is a calculation used by astronomers to identify the motion of the galaxies because they are so far away just by looking at it and measuring the shape and size of the galaxy how they are increasing does not make sense so they study the wavelength the the waves of light coming towards us and they observe the pattern of shifting of these wavelengths the, there will be only two kind of shifts one will be uh, either towards the blue side or towards the red side now when it is towards the blue side the shifting is towards us that means object is coming closer to us when it is towards the red side that means the object is going away from us of all the objects in the known universe there is only one object that has a blue shift and that is andromeda galaxy that means that is coming towards us and in about 5 billion years we are going to collide with it again we get the newton and the black holes okay so neutron stars like i said uh, is one of the early stages of a dead star all right so as a super massive big star when it has burned all the fuel and from hydrogen gas it has converted everything down to iron the star literally does not have any more energy to convert it into something else okay so the iron core is there now as the element gets heavier it kind of compresses in size also so the outer layer gives away because there are uh, not enough forces acting on the star to remain intact 
Now, what happens is, as it gives away the high, high amount of energy, temperature, pressure, everything which is bouncing on the uh, iron core, fuses all the elements, uh, you know, all the atoms of the iron together. The protons and electrons they merge and they kind of become uh, neutrons, and the neutrons are already there. So this becomes a neutron star. And neutron stars are very dense stars. They are sometimes so dense that even a teaspoon of a neutron star can weigh more than the planet Earth. They are that heavy. Now, that is a neutron star is is a case with some kind of stars. If the stars are even bigger, even larger than that, and then they give out their outer shell, everything collapses further to such dense. Uh, you know, uh, such dense matter that even the radiation or the light does not appear to come out of it, and that is what we call as a black hole. A black hole is not something which appears black in color. But it is, uh, it but it is called black hole because there is absolutely nothing there, whereas there should be something that we know there is something, but we can't see it. So that is what a black hole is. Sir, I have heard about some kind of a bacteria which help in development of life in planets. Is it right? Yes, uh, they are called as uh, uh, targeters uh, or uh, uh, targeters. Uh, they are microorganisms. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not really getting the name right. Uh, let me just uh, do a quick Google search and uh, tell you. Uh, yes, it is called Tagrid. T A G R I D. Uh, they can even survive absolutely zero temperature and zero pressure, just like in vacuum. So, uh, a lot of study is being going on them. Warm. Sir, I want to know is wormhole exist uh, and can we do time travel in future? Because if you want to do time travel, we have to travel in space at 90% of the speed of light. So it means that we can't see our future. All right. So wormhole. See, um, I think about 50 years ago, when people used to talk about black holes, they were considered mad. Right. Now, why they were considered mad? Because nobody had heard or uh, studied anything like that so far. Black holes now we know exist because not only theoretically but mathematically and observational wise also we have a picture of black hole now exist all right and the scientists are working on something similar to white hole or wormhole or you know things like that if that is the case then i believe we have to wait for the time when all these uh, things can you know just unravel themselves in front of us but as of right now it's just in theory it's just a hypothesis and there is no evidence of proof of it so if Minakshi you are interested in studying about it why don't you take up science and start doing research about it after your graduation right that would be something interesting that you would really enjoy doing about it yeah so does, does quantum, quantum physics exist? Yes, quantum physics exists. There are a lot of professors I know who teach quantum physics. If if it didn't exist, they probably will lose their job. So yeah, quantum <laughs> physics exists. Physics at a macro level and at a micro level may differ significantly. The Newton's laws that we follow everywhere around may not be applicable to those tiny little particles, the atoms or the electrons and everything there. All right. So, yes, it's a completely different branch of physics, completely 
different from what we study in our school but again it is so very complicated that it can't be even introduced at a school level or at a very young you know age in the college so it is generally at a higher level where you study quantum physics and there are people who are doing great bounds and leaps in the field and uh, they would be very happy to prove that they exist and the science exists Um, this question I'm getting very repeatedly about the zombie yeah. star uh, and Srishti A. Tiwari. Please post your question again because you have written. Please take my question. I can't see your question. Please post it again. All right. So what are zombies? Zombies are basically, uh, again, in hypothesis, zombies are uh, living beings who are brain dead. Like their body function, they can walk, they can, uh, you know, move their hands around. But their brain is dead. A star can be there. It has impact on other neighboring stars or some kind of planetary system around uh, in terms of gravity, in terms of some other aspect. But the star is dead officially. That means there is no chemical reaction happening. The hydrogen is not converting into helium or into any other element. So a star might be dead, but it has its own gravitational pull. It is not a black hole. It, it generally happens with small stars, something like our sun or stars which are smaller than sun. They, they After they die, they convert into a white dwarf, then brown dwarf and then finally black dwarfs. So black dwarfs are also called as zombie stars. Okay, uh, our universe, can the universe ever end and how many solar systems exist in the universe? So the universe may or may not end, we don't know because we don't know how the universe originated. And in terms of the solar system, there is only one solar system that is ours. The system of planets orbiting around the sun is named after the parent star. The name of our sun is Sol. So our planetary system became solar system. Similarly, a planetary system on any other star will should be named after that star. There are so far in just a very closer reach or probably about 10 or 15 percent of our own galaxy is uh, counting around 8000. So there are 8000 such planetary systems around us. That is there. Uh, if the universe is only 14 billion years old, why isn't the most distant object we can see 7 billion light years away? Very good. Because we are at the center of the universe. The universe, age and distance are two different things. All right. 14 billion year old universe means the farthest known object from our Earth. Okay. To the other side. All right. So let's say Earth is here. And this is where we are looking at. All right, so this thing is 14 billion. So the entire size of the universe can be 28 billion also. All right. I hope, Srishti, you got uh, Priyanka. I think the question is asked by you got the clarification. And with this, we'll take the last question by Komal because. Our universe is expanding day by day, so we could not never calculate the size of the universe. Actually, uh, we can, but as our universe is expanding, the size will keep on changing. The good part is, there is a very easy way to calculate at what rate our universe is expanding. But for that, we need to know the size of the universe. So once we know the size of the universe and we know the rate of expanding, uh, the rate at which the universe is expanding, I think it is pretty easy to say that the universe size at any given point can be calculated thereafter. Okay. So we'll take his question because he's continuously messaging in the chat box. Okay. Please take my question. Yeah. Sun is hot, but why space is cold? Oh, yes. So, uh, have you ever gone to kitchen when your mother is cooking or when your maid is cooking? Anybody who uses a gas stove 
the stove is on there is fire there but around the fire everything is hot but at a little distance from it everything is cold or let's say you have gone on camping there's bonfire in the middle of the december night it's just freezing outside the moment you put your hand close to the fire you feel warm but the moment you bring it back you feel cold it is because the heat does not move just like that the heat can move in three ways conduction convection and radiation in space heat moves using the third method that is through radiation and the radiation does not carry enough of heat to heat up the entire universe understand the two stars in the universe in our own galaxy the closest one to earth is 4.2 light years away that means the energy from sun is taking 4.2 years to reach to the nearby star let's say somewhere 2.1 light years in between they meet still it's a vast space for a ray of light to heat up everything all right so the universe is much larger than anything which is hot there that is why the universe is cold does that answer your question yes i think uh, you got the clarification so with this we'll uh, end this session and thank you everyone for your active participation uh, we can clearly judge with the question and amount of the feedback they have given like uh, they they got the idea of the entire session like the question they are putting really give us some insight they have got the clear idea what we have discussed during the session so thank you sne thank you very much thank you very much for having me here and with, uh, with the end of this um, session i'll definitely want to quote whatever you have written in the live slide the universe is full of mysteries and lot of them is still need to be understand with the little what limited technology we have in your hand and we really look forward uh, as the budding participants are in the session to have some of the good astronomer who work in this direction to bring certain changes so thank you everyone thank you for joining and want to give you a, a kind gentle reminder for tomorrow's session that is women in space uh, 11 o'clock will be uh, streaming that on the planetarium youtube channel so if you are interested please do join us thank you everyone take care bye